And so, Father, we gather in the sanctuary, we gather to uh, receive a drink from uh, living waters. And, Father, we ask that that living water may well uh, up within us uh, and that it may flow through us. And so we thank you for uh, the promise of your work and your activity, your presence uh, with us every time uh, we, in faith, uh, seek your presence. And so, Father, for all the moments in our histories where we have drunk from living water, we think of those moments where people have led us to living water. We think of our parents teaching us about going to those places, um, taking our beings into those places where living water is accessible. We want to give you thanks for all those places and for all those people who have allowed us to drink. Uh, to have our deep needs addressed. And so, Father, thank you for being the kind of God who will take us to those places where we can drink from you. We thank you for that water which addresses every need that that water uh, brings cleansing, that that water brings life, that by that water we are saved, we are brought to life, um, that in that water there uh, is abundance. And Father, we ask too that your church and that we, uh, your church, may be places where once we have drunk from that water, become a source uh, of your presence and your love and your care uh, amongst others. Will every drink that we have of the living water be of benefit uh, to other people, those that we are family to, those uh, friends, colleagues, uh, those that we meet uh, during the course of our week. And so, Father, we ask that you will use this time uh, to meet with us and to minister to each one of us. We trust that uh, you will do the work that you need to do in each one of our lives. Amen. Amen. We have uh, two wonderful uh, flower messages. The first is from uh, the Harrison family in loving memory of Jack and Gertie Harrison. Uh, in their message, no amount of time passing can ever dull the memories of the time that was spent together as a family and the wisdom that was passed on from your generation to ours. And so as we remember you, rest in peace. Um, and it will always be a loving memory from the Harrison uh, family. And then, um, happy anniversary uh, to the love of my life, Kaylee. Thank God for blessing me with you, a strong will, God-fearing woman who fills my life with joy and with purpose. Your love inspires me every day. I cherish every moment we share, and so may God continue to bless our union with endless love, unforgettable memories, boundless laughter. I love you with all that I am and all that I hope to be. Uh, from those who are banished to the <laughs> cry room today, uh, from Jason uh, to Kaylee. And so uh, we just celebrate uh, the bonds of love uh, which unite us to uh, one another forever. And so congrats uh, to Jason, to Kaylee, and uh, mindful of the Harrisons today. This is our second last focus on the sermon series uh, Living in Grace. I trust that 
It has been a worthwhile series. Um, next week we will wrap it up by uh, just having a look uh, at the alternative to the cycle of works, um, the way of living uh, that is often promoted in this world. Um, and so we will be given a godly alternative uh, to the way of works uh, in a summary next week. But for today, I want to um, focus on uh, grace uh, being offered. And uh, grace offered is uh, always a double action. Uh, it's offered to you, uh, and it's to be offered from you. And so it's that that we're going to focus on uh, today. The grace that is offered to you, and the grace that you offer to others. And so we um, always do well to look at the person of Jesus uh, whenever we need to figure out um, what is offered to us and what is uh, offered from us. So I want to read from John chapter 20, verse 19 uh, to 31. It's uh, a number of post-resurrection accounts uh, and it ends John's Gospel, um, and so we read uh, from verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus again said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, as has been done to me, uh, so I will send you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. And though the doors were still locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But that which is recorded is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in Jesus' name. The Lord will always bless the hearing of his word. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so there we have um, a couple of snippets of the life of Jesus. Um, a, an experience of other people of the resurrected Jesus. The disciples um, prior to this have discovered an empty tomb. Uh, they've gone home even more confused than they were when Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was put to death. Now there is an empty tomb. Uh, they're not sure what has happened to Jesus. Mary of Magdala has remained uh, behind. The risen Jesus has appeared to her. She's run off uh, to tell the disciples who were with her uh, that she has experienced the risen Christ. The next evening, while the disciples are gathered behind closed doors, just anxious, full of fear, wondering if 
what happened to Jesus is going to have some kind of repercussion on their life. They are fearful and they are hiding away from further persecution. And Jesus appears in their presence. And as the presence of Jesus is experienced, there's a word of comfort. There's a moment of empowerment. Jesus gives them something that they don't have. And then there's this instruction for them to go out into the world. Just as the Father sent me into this world, you must go out into the world. And as you go out into this world, will you emphasize the message of forgiveness? A week later, he appears to them again. He invites Thomas to witness his resurrected presence. And then he says something very, very interesting to Thomas. He says that blessing awaits those who will believe in him without seeing him. And we must try and interpret that in the light of what's just happened. That as we go out into this world, in the same way that Jesus went out into this world, so as we follow Jesus and the way that Jesus went out into the world, as we emphasize forgiveness, others will come to faith without seeing him. Then the disciples, we can add uh, one extra post-resurrection account recorded in the uh, other Gospels. The disciples are found fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Um, again, they have regressed. Uh, Jesus told them, I will make you fishers of men. Come and follow me. Now they're fishing fish again. But it's the comfort. It's, this world doesn't make sense. It's, it's confusing. Let me retreat into the familiar. And so they're out fishing, but there is no benefit. After a night, they catch nothing. And Jesus appears on the shoreline. He instructs his disciples to try one more time. And as they do, they catch many, many fish. And somehow in this moment, there's this realization happening within Peter. This is Jesus. Jesus is in our presence again. And so he jumps off the boat. He swims ashore while the others deal with the catch. And by the time the rest of the disciples catch up with him and Jesus, there's a fire with fish and bread already cooking. And the disciples fellowship with the resurrected Christ. And so we have these four accounts. Four accounts of Jesus engaging with his disciples. After most probably the most disappointing, the most gut-wrenching moment where Jesus has faced his greatest need with not one friend in solidarity. There's been a dismal performance in discipleship. And we get these four snippets of the resurrected Christ. Interesting how he responds to them. A little earlier we sang uh, a wonderful song and the worship team has a habit of checking my preaching notes before I preach it. So they steal my thunder. Objects of mercy that should have known wrath. Huh? Isn't that a good description of Jesus' presence amongst his disciples. No anger shown from Jesus 
to his disciples. No condemnation offered from Jesus to his disciples. There should have been some condemnation. They failed dismally. They didn't even get close to passing Relationships 101. Hey? It was all about them. If it's beneficial for me, I'll hang around you. If it's not beneficial, I'm out of here. That's what they did. Not one word of condemnation. No grudge. You owe me. Just remember this moment. No lecture to those who had deserted and dissociated with him in his greatest time of need. And so there's this consistency that builds up in those four uh, post-resurrection accounts where Jesus chooses a higher agenda. Appropriate responses, there were many. Justified, there were many. He chooses a higher agenda. He offers grace. And as he offers grace to his disciples, the disciples realize that the grace is offered in the midst of their brokenness. Not after they were fixed. In the midst of their brokenness, he offers them grace. But he offers a grace that affirms the original goodness of who they were before they entered into the acts that stained and spoiled and marred and broke down. It's not about your performance, disciples. It's about who you are and it's about who you can be. And that's what's acceptable to me, not your performance. This is not a performance-based engagement. And so, instead of knowing wrath, they know grace. They know that despite their effort, they are acceptable to Jesus. That's the picture that Jesus wants to leave with the disciples. In the same way that I have been sent to you, in this graceful way, I want to send you into this world so that you can live by a higher agenda than offering wrath to those who deserve wrath. I wonder if we share the same agenda. Can we seek that higher agenda when our engagement with another has caused us hurt? Can we seek that higher agenda when our engagement with another has meant that they have distanced themselves from us, disowned us, disassociated themselves? You're on your own. If only we knew how to offer this grace of acceptance. If only we knew the difference that that grace of acceptance could make to the way that we live and could make to the way that others live. There is a resurrection reality of Jesus that is on offer. There is a grace on offer. There is an acceptability of you and of me and of all others on offer. But it needs to be realized. And so I'm hoping that just a closer look at Jesus will give us a clue uh, to this kingdom reality of offering grace and offering acceptance. How did Jesus do it? Because if we can figure out how Jesus did it, well then maybe 
we can be mindful of that and allow Jesus to teach us what he already knows. And so just three thoughts around that. First of all, I think Jesus could offer, the grace, uh, could offer grace and could offer acceptance because those were things that he knew he had received. Just think a little bit about it. Just Jesus receiving, uh, receiving grace or receiving acceptability just as he lived his life, just from very human sources. Think of the grace that was offered to him by his mother while he was still in her womb. An unwanted and unplanned and unexplainable pregnancy. A disruptive pregnancy. A shameful pregnancy. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. A wonderful grace offered from Mary to her child who is to be born. Jesus knew of this grace of acceptance uh, that came from his parents. Just as they were his parents, as they cared for him, as they guided him, as they protected him, as they provided for him, in order that he could, as we are told in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, that he could grow, that he could gain in strength, that he could become wise. Just elements of personal development. I will give you this gift. I will make space. I will sacrifice so that these can be your realities. He knew of this grace as space was made by his religious community as he led them in sharing the word of God uh, as he enters into adolescence in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. There are lots and lots of people who can lead us in a word of God today, but Jesus, as you enter into manhood, come and share with us. We're going to make space and we're going to receive from you. And so this grace of acceptance that is offered from very, very human sources just opens up to Jesus the possibility, man, if people can be this good to me, imagine how good God my Father is. I wonder what he's got to offer me. And so this grace comes to him. It comes to him particularly at the moment of baptism, where he is given this, this heavenly identity. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. He's given a heavenly calling. And from that moment, he knows that he goes in the name of his father into this world to minister. And that's exactly what happens. And as a result of that moment of grace, his ministry is characterized by the qualities of heaven. He goes out and he offers love where love was not the only option. But he raises to a higher agenda and offers it nonetheless. He goes out and he ministers in all goodness and in all power and begins a revolution. At the end of his ministry, with one week before his death, he goes up a mountain. He has another experience with God his Father. And in the presence of his disciples, they hear this deep affirmation. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And so as he's going into most probably the most uncertain week of his life, the most difficult week of his life, he has this wonderful affirmation. You are my son. Will you receive it? It's my gift to you. 
and those who can hear or see what's going on, will you listen to Jesus in this, in this last week? He's on the right track. He's going to reveal something. He's going to change this world, your world. Listen to him. And so there's that moment of deep affirmation, a moment of validation, a moment of reminding who he is and whose he is. It's just a moment of him receiving the grace of God and receiving an acceptance from God the Father. And so Jesus just lives with this deep experience of the grace and of the acceptance of his Father. And it comes from various sources at different times of his life. And so as he looks back on his life, he can track moments of grace and moments of acceptability. I'm wondering if I invited you to recall your historical and current experiences of life. Would you be able to do the same? Would you be able to track those moments where grace was offered and where acceptance was offered? You might need to look past uh, some of the uh, attention-grabbing moments of your life. Uh, sometimes the tough moments, uh, moments of rejection, who try and make our lives all about that moment. Look past it. It was just a moment. There are other moments in your life. Or the alienation that you've experienced. Look past it. Not because they're non-issues, but just because they are not the only realities in your life and they have a tendency to push themselves into a position that they don't rightfully occupy. Track the moments of grace and of acceptance. What are those moments? Those moments that have come to you from, in very normal ways, from very human sources, and those moments of grace and acceptance that you've received in exceptional ways and in exceptional circumstances. And you can only attribute those moments to being acts of God, which have been a deep affirmation and a deep uh, val validation of who you are and what you're about. And so that's the first thing, is that uh, Jesus offers grace and offers acceptance. Why? Because he knows about it already. And he knows what it's done to him. He knows its power. He knows how it's formed him. And he knows that if others live by this power and are formed by this power, they will witness to God. The second clue that Jesus offers about the grace and acceptance that is from God is that he reflects the Father's acceptance of him or he mirrors that to others. And so it's not just something he experiences, but it's something that he offers. The grace of Jesus is received. But after it's received, then it is offered. It becomes grace for all. And that's one of the messages that John is so strong in trying to convey to you and to me. We can go to the beginning of the, um, the gospel and we've seen it at the end. It's about this grace that is offered. And so in John chapter 1 verse 16, it says, from the fullness of Christ, we have all received. Hey? In Christ's fullness, he offers what? Grace upon grace upon grace. 
And so because Jesus receives the grace of acceptance, he realizes that it's to become the outpouring from his life. He can choose to live his life in other ways. But if he wants to live a godly life, well then he's going to live a life where he pours out grace upon grace upon grace. Because he had given, because he had been given the grace of acceptance, Jesus offers the same grace to those, especially those who had forgotten about this offer from God. And so he goes out and he welcomes and offers grace to the outcast and to the estranged. He brings healing to those that have been broken in life. Because Jesus knows of the grace of acceptance, he offers the same grace in all his resurrection experiences. And so we must not think that it would be any different for each one of us. God's offer through Christ is grace upon grace upon grace. And you are not disqualified from that. Jesus offers grace and acceptance to all. His love for people and how Jesus values people will always be warm and welcoming. Huh? Go back to John 20. Go back to those, even at our most disappointing, we will be the object of mercy. We will receive his grace at our most disappointing in those places where we should know his wrath. And that offer creates circumstances which are life-changing. It's the one place that I can go to where I know that I'm safe and, can be tr and uh, God can be trusted. I can't trust the very worst of myself with everybody. But I can trust the worst of myself with God. Because I know that although I should know his wrath, I will know of his grace. And so that acceptance convinces me that there's nothing about me that will result in him turning away from me. That unconditional offer, that higher agenda of grace, allows me to let go of a performance-based evaluation of me. It's not about what I've done or what I haven't done. I can just experience an unconditional love. And in that unconditional love, I've got nothing to defend. I can just disclose myself for who I am. And there are not many relationships where that's possible. The moment somebody hears about a weakness, it's, hmm, you've devalued in worth in my presence. Not so with God. And so I can share who I truly am. I can disclose everything that is good uh, in terms of my faith. But I can also say, Jesus, sometimes I'm Thomas, and I have a couple of doubts. And I know grace will be his response. I can come to him in all my joy. And then when joy is not my experience, when life has robbed me of joy, I can even come to him in pain and know that it will not be an awkward moment. I can come to him and uh, share with him all the hope that I have for my future, but not without saying this is some of my anxiety. I can celebrate those moments where I've been courageous. But say to him, you know, Jesus, 
In this moment, I was overcome by fear. I can share my successes in the midst of failure. I can share triumphs, but say that there have been a few tragic moments as well. I can share my life of virtue, but never be unaware of the vices that are lie within me. And so that's the gift of acceptance. When we learn of that kind of love, well then people don't need to perform in front of us. And when they don't need to perform, they can disclose who they truly are will surface. And as who they truly are is surfaced, not all of what surfaces is good. And so there's stuff that will be dealt with. But it's owned. I'm this and I'm that. And as this and as that, how can I offer myself as a gift to this world instead of withdrawing, retreating, saying I'm of no value to anybody because I'm this and that. It's a massive, massive difference living in grace and acceptance. And so Jesus reflects the grace of his Father's acceptance. He becomes someone who is convinced that there is life in grace and acceptance. And so he says, well, if that's my experience, it should also be yours. And so he offers it. He becomes part of the source of the grace and acceptance in other people's lives. And in that way, as Jesus was sent into this world by the Father, so he sends you and me. Can you become a source of God's grace and acceptance in other people's lives? Well, it's going to require you to be sent out with a very, very big focus on forgiveness. It's not going to come any other way. But Jesus has prepared us for that. And so you and I, we can offer this grace to others. We can offer it to others, especially when they've forgotten or when they've been marginalized or when they are estranged or when they're broken. There's a grace to be received. And your acceptability is not based on being forgotten or marginalized or estranged by anybody. And your acceptability is not based on not being broken. And so we too can form relationships which are warm, which are welcoming. We too can uh, offer love and welcome. It's just a fundamental part of being called into the ways of Christ. And if it is not other people's experience of you and me as Christ followers, well, something's amiss and we require to go back and get some heavenly treatment. Something needs to be addressed inside of us. We might even need a heart transplant. We might need a filling of that thirst quenching water. One last clue that Jesus gives to this kingdom reality of living in grace and acceptance is that acceptance will usher in a God-given identity 
and it's God's Spirit who will guide our life into next moments. From the resurrection account that I, I read to you a little earlier, you will remember that moment when Jesus appears to his disciples and before they get sent into the world to do what Jesus did, he breathes God's spirit into them. God's acceptance of us uh, doesn't come with a to-do list for transformation. That's not the way of God. That's just a clinical and an impersonal self-help program. God's acceptance of us doesn't come with a seven-point strategic plan for holy living. That's just an imitation of a business plan for success. God offers an encounter with him personally. And in that encounter, he offers us our true identity. This is who you are. This is whose you are. This is what you are to do. And so he says, if only you knew what I knew, then you could not help but love yourself. If only you knew what I knew, if only you knew that you are God's energy in human form, that you are a burning bush, that you material, but you are a fire with God's presence. If you knew that about yourself, you would live differently in this world. If only you knew what I know, that you have an inner treasure. And from that treasure you can go and offer, you can spend that grace and that acceptance that you know. You can go and spend that on others. And so the blessing of the world awaits. The blessing of people who maybe haven't been blessed or don't feel blessed. The way of grace is an experience that others are waiting for. The offer of acceptance just as they are before they do or don't do anything good or bad. It's possible. But it's waiting for you and for me to take that which we know, that which we've experienced, and for us to become sources of grace and acceptance in the lives of others. And so may this world be blessed with such grace offered by you and offered by me, all because of the source of grace, which is God himself. Amen. Amen. We pray together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful glimpse of life lived with a risen Christ. And Father, we know that it, it took the disciples a while to figure out what such living was all about. But we know too that they changed the world. And so Father, we ask that we may know of that grace and that we may go out into this world and that we may figure out your way for us in this world and that through us your grace and acceptance may be offered to those in our worlds. We ask us in your name. Amen.
the Lord.